succeeding with software at scale is incredibly hard. I saw one software disaster after another. It's uh, pretty much about uh, taking my psychology background and putting up top of the technical work that I do. I think uh, the, the hotspot analysis makes our not to do lists longer and it shortens the, the to do list. How do I figure out uh, negative trends which are not horrible yet? If I go to a client and say that, you know, uh, rewrite this code, it's only 20,000 lines of code. They are not going to be happy, right? It's not actionable. The thing is that most other metrics are just as bad. This episode was made possible thanks to Gotopia.tech. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the GoTo Book Club. Uh, I am Sven Johan. I work for InnoQ. I like improving systems. I like to talk about it. Um, I like to teach it. I like to write about it. And uh, today I have uh, as guest um, Adam Thornhill. Uh, Adam, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, sure. Thanks, Sven, and thanks for having me here. So I'm Adam Thornhill. I'm a programmer and psychologist. Been working in the software industry for 25 years. And I spent uh, the past five years uh, building a platform called uh, CodeScene, working with code analysis. I'm also the author of a couple of books, and I like to think that the best known books are Your Code is a Crime Scene and Software Design X-Rays. Yeah, actually quite an interesting uh, combination. How, how did it uh, come that you studied computer science and psychology? So uh, my experience was I started to work in the software industry in 1997. And after a couple of years, I kind of noticed a pattern that succeeding with software at scale is incredibly hard, right? I saw one software disaster after another. So at some point, I just want to try to understand why is it so hard to write good code? And I kind of decided to seek the answers within psychology because psychology, I think, has a lot to offer to us in our traditional technical field. You know, psychology is about how we think, how we reason, how we solve problems, and also how we collaborate with others. And uh, originally, I just signed up for on one semester, but, you know, psychology is really, really fun. So after that semester, I thought like, okay, let's dive into one more topic and then one more topic. So I ended up spending six years at the university. So I took my degree by accident, more or less. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I did once a Coursera course, like an introduction to psychology. Uh, basically, it was only the, you know, the most famous uh, psychology cases. And it was also very fascinating. But um, yeah, it's, yeah, I stopped after, after one semester. So, uh, but yeah, nice. And I think, you know, this rare combination um, brought, to me at least, uh, a totally new thinking about improving systems. So um, before I read your first book, uh, Your Code as a Crime Scene, um, I used tools like uh, like Zona. And, you know, I, I don't think that Zona is like a bad tool. I really like it. It's, you know, it helps you seeing um, uh, problems with your code. Uh, but it makes it really hard to prioritize your work. You know, if, if you if, if you run a, like a sonar analysis and it tells you you have uh, 3 million findings and your technical depth is uh, uh, three, uh, 2,000 years, you know, it takes 2,000 years to pay it back. It's, it's just not helpful. I have to invest a lot of time to understand what's really important. Yeah? And also the tool, even if I figure out what's important, the tool cannot really, cannot really help me. Um, but okay, that, that's uh, how we how we worked in the past. But then you know your your tool came along, and I think it made it really easy to to prioritize. And um, yeah, maybe maybe we should uh, talk about uh, yeah the the thinking about the prioritization uh, in that one. So you called the type of prioritization, if I if if I say that correctly, a behavioral a code analysis. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And it's uh, pretty much about uh, taking my psychology background and putting up top of the technical work that I do. So uh, the whole idea is that uh, I agree with you that static analysis, to me, it's, it's also a valuable practice, right? It's something that works very well, I think, as a low-level feedback loop when writing code. But static analysis, like you point out, has this, it has this property simply that it treats all code as equal, right? Because there's no such thing as a business priority when you just look at the source code. And that leads to having thousands of findings. So what I do instead is that I look at how do we, as a development organization, how do we interact with the code we're building? 
So in practice, that means looking at things like uh, version control data. You might look at things like uh, Jira data and so on, because then you can kind of um, you can kind of calculate the impact of each one of the findings. So what that does basically is that it gives you a window into all those code quality issues and tells you that this is what's important and uh, this might be problematic long term, but we can most likely live with it for now. So that's like one of the things. The other thing that I kind of noticed uh, with static analysis is that once an organization grows beyond, the, I would say just a handful of people, then organizational factors like uh, coordination between different teams, team coupling, key personal dependencies, knowledge distribution, all that kind of stuff tends to become at least maybe even more important than any technical properties of the code. And static analysis was simply not designed to help us with those aspects, right? It's, yeah. it's yeah, exactly. So yeah, that, that was pretty much uh, where I decided to call it behavior code analysis. It's about more about the behavior of the organization uh, rather than the code. Um, when I tried to to prioritize, I also thought about our customers. You know, how many, uh, for, for example, um, uh, codes which is used very often or executed very often because of customer use. Is, would that also be part of an of an idea to prioritize uh, by by how customers are interacting with the system? I mean, it could uh, could definitely be an aspect, right? So. Um your typical, you know, software is interesting because it has uh, these power laws everywhere, right? And so you look at code and it's like 80% uh, of your code is never touched. You look at uh, your feature set and it's most likely the same thing, right? That most customers use a smaller subset of your features, right? Mm -hmm. So clearly there is a priority aspect there as well. For me, it was easy to convince, for example, a product owner to, uh, you know, for for improving codes when I could say, you know, this is part of the 80% usage pattern or something like that. Okay. Um, so, and then, um, I mean, you, you wrote the book, uh, uh, your code is a crime scene. And then, uh, and now you, you publish a new book, a software design X-rays. What was a new learning you had to, to write a, a, a you know, a follow-up book? Yeah. So, uh, your code is a crime scene. It's a book I wrote in, uh, 2014. And what I did back then was basically I captured a number of techniques that I had used myself in my previous life as a software consultant. So it's techniques for prioritizing technical depth to communicate with non-technical stakeholders. It's stuff that I found useful myself. So I published the book and it got quite a lot of attention. And I kind of realized that uh, if I want these techniques to become mainstream, then there has to be some good tooling around them, right? So shortly after publishing that book, I founded uh, Codesyn, the company, to kind of build those tools. And as part of those early years with Codesyn, I was fortunate to work with so many organizations across the globe. So I worked with organizations on using different technologies uh, of all kinds of scale. And I learned so much about that. And I basically, with software design x-rays, to try to reflect those learnings. How well does this stuff work in practice? And even more important, how do you act upon it? Because information is only good when actionable. Yeah. So that was the main motivation. Yeah, that was. Uh, also, I, I mean, I like a lot uh, about the book. Actually, about both books, but the the software design X rays. It it usually has a recommendation. You know what to do with those uh, findings, but we can we can uh, dive into that a bit uh, later. So the first part is, and you know, that's for me still the most fascinating. Um, uh, uh, Part of your work uh, is hotspots and X-rays. So, what is what is a hotspot? So, a hotspot is a complicated code that we also have to work with often. So, it's a combination of uh, technical factors like uh, code quality issues, design smells, together with uh, frequent development activity in that part of the code. So, that's basically a hotspot, and uh, the whole hotspot concept it came out of my experience of uh, using static analysis to try to prioritize findings. And like we spoke about earlier, I simply lack the priorities from the business side, right? And I also faced these challenges of communicating with uh, non-technical stakeholders. Because very often I try to explain that, okay, uh, yeah, we the business presses for this feature, but maybe we should take a step back and improve what's already there so that we can implement it safely, right? And on time. And I found that those conversations, they were extremely hard to have because uh, software, 
it simply lacks visibility, right? There's no way I can take my software system, pick it up and show it to my technical, non-technical stakeholders. So at the same time that I was wrestling with these problems, I was also in the middle of my psychology studies and I took a bunch of courses in forensic psychology. And that's where the hotspot concept actually came from. So I was inspired by a technique called geographical offender profiling. And you know, geographical offender profiling, it's something forensics use, right? So they, what you do is basically you look at the geographical distribution of different crime scenes in a city or in an area. And then you calculate mathematically a probability surface that can kind of help you predict what's the home base of the offender. So you know which area to patrol and supervise. And when I learned about that, I think something just kind of clicked because I kind of thought that, wow, what if we can do the same for software? You know, what if we can take this large software system, get the probability surface onto it and say that, hey, these are the parts of the code that are very likely to change in the future too. And these are the more stable parts of the code, things like that, right? Then we could suddenly, you know, we would get some real priorities on what needs to improve and where code quality is most important. So a very lengthy answer to a simple question. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, you, you do that by, uh, by uh, let's say, combining static code analysis and mining uh, software repositories. So uh, code, which, yeah, code which has a lot of commits and is bad, that's kind of problematic and we, we should uh, work on it. And yeah, I mean, it, for, for me, it's, it's so easy uh, now to explain let's say to, to uh, let's say business stakeholders, why this is important because technical debt, you know, you have, you have the metaphor technical debt, it lacks a little bit with financial debt, but still you, you can say, well, we have an interest and we have a principle we have to pay back. And, you know, what is actually the interest rate? And you answered the question, the inter interest rate on code, which is, so, so interest means I have to spend more time thinking on pretty bad code when I add a new feature because the code is not ideal for implementing the new feature. And, uh, and of course, if I have code which is really bad and I have to change it quite often, the interest rate is very high. So uh, to me, it really to, it, it sticks um, to, to my mind. Um, what, what is your experience with your with your customers? So, uh, I mean, of, I'm only one single person who is doing it rarely, but uh, you do it all the time. So, does it does that stick to let's say non technical stakeholders all the time, or rarely, or you know how 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 does it work for you? Yeah, so uh, that, that's an interesting question, and um, uh, the short answer is that I have a good experience, which is great. Otherwise, I wouldn't have food on the table, right? So. Uh, I'm kind of happy about that. And my experience is that non-technical stakeholders, because these techniques were originally, I kind of targeted engineering organizations and occasionally as a bonus, non-technical stakeholders. And my experience is that non-technical stakeholders, they like it because a hotspot analysis sends a positive message. It basically tells you that, no, you don't have to fix all technical debt, right? You have to fix this debt. That's really critical, but you can safely live with this technical debt. You need to be aware of it, of course, but you don't need to pay it down now. So it's a positive message for them because they're also wrestling with these long and short term, short term priorities. Like uh, you have all these features that the business pushes for. And at the same time, there is some awareness that we need to improve things, right? So I like to think that's the main contribution. Yeah, exactly. So it's um, what you say, you can, you can improve. I mean, there is always something to improve. If, you know, if, if someone asks me, you know, if we have a software system to improve, yeah, there are a, a, a gazillion things to do. The question is, what's the, what brings the most value for your work? You know, because you always have, of course, um, uh, opportunity cost, yeah? and you know if I if I improve this, I cannot improve the other thing, and yeah, it's I think uh, the the hotspot analysis makes our not to do lists longer, and it shortens the the to do list. What you're also doing is you have um, you have a trend analysis, and um, yeah, I like trends. You know, um, if if you're good and you have, but you have a negative trend <laughs> that tells you you have to improve something, um, and also if, if the other way around, 
how do you analyze uh, those trends? So how are you how are you doing it? Yeah, so uh, to me, trends are what makes all the data truly actionable. Uh, because I very often meet organizations, they might be struggling with something like a legacy code migration or uh, they have an existing system that they're earning money on, they need to continue to be able to maintain it. And you have this constant pressure for new features, right? So I always tell them that, you know, to manage technical debt, step zero, the absolutely first thing to do is to avoid taking on more debt, right? So simply put like a quality bar on what's already there and make sure it doesn't get worse, no matter where you start from. And I think that's, uh, again, something that resonates with um, managers and technical leaders, because I'm yet to meet anyone that tells me we want our code to get worse. You never hear that, right? So it's actionable. So that's the first thing. The other reason I like trends is because they carry so much more information than any absolute values. So for example, in code scene, we have this uh, concept of code health, right? It's a metric that goes from 10, healthy code, code that's easy to understand, low risk, all the way down to one, which is code with severe maintenance issues. And let me say that I point you to a hotspot with a code health of five. Is that good or bad? Well, if that uh, hotspot had a code health of eight the week before, then it's disastrous, right? Because it degrades rapidly. It's something you need to act upon now. But on the other hand, if that hotspot had a code health of two the week before, then it's a dramatic improvement that needs to be celebrated, right? So trends carry this information, whereas absolute values don't. So when I used uh, a code scene, for me, it was like a, not a one-time thing. But when, when I see my first analysis, I'm like, okay, now I see the, you know, the, the red part. So we, I mean, we also have to say we, we have some screenshots, of course, on that one. But you, you, you have those parts which are uh, bad code changed often. And then, you know, to me, it triggers the thing, okay, um, all the red things, those are the ones which should be on my uh, to-do list. But how do I see, let's say, um, parts which are, uh, which are good, but they are getting worse and worse but they don't show up like red on your on on on, on you know on any on, on code scene so how, how do how do i figure out uh, negative trends which are not horrible yet if i remember correctly i had uh, a chapter discussing this in software design x rays i think it's the last chapter where i talk a little bit about how you can use the trends as an early warning system and I think this is really, really important. And uh, it's so important that we spend a lot of effort building it into codes in as well. So we integrate with things like pull requests and build pipelines, right? So you can kind of get an alert when things like that happen. And I think it's vitally important because um, one thing I learned that actually surprised me was that I, I kind of I feel, like to think like so many other in the software industry, we have this idea that code starts out fine, right? And then they will have the pressure of the business and the code kind of degrades over time. But that's not what's happening in general. What's happening in general is that if, if you find a module with quality problems, low code health, most likely those problems have been introduced where we were early on, often in the first version of that module. And once a module degrades in code, that's tend to be like a self-amplifying loop, right? Because the hurdle to refactoring is large. So instead we kind of squeeze in more complexity and more complexity and it gets worse and worse. So using this kind of information, you can actually set different quality gates and say that for new code, this is the minimum level of uh, uh, quality or health that we accept, right? And then you can use it as an early warning system, which allows you to prevent a ton of future problems. Yeah, so if, if the bad code is, I mean, to, to me, it's also surprising. That was a surprising insight from the book that bad code is more or less uh, from the beginning bad. <laughs> but you also wrote that bad code um, usually stays bad. So, you know, it's bad, you fix it, but then it's coming, it's coming back. Why do you think that's the, that's the case? So I think there are several reasons, right? So... It's one of the things I noticed early on, shortly after writing your code as a crime scene, when I started to work with this, when I started to work with organizations. And I kind of figure out that, you know, we found these really, really problematic hotspots. And then you start to look at the trends and you saw that these hotspots, they have been problems for years. 
And at first, I kind of couldn't explain that. So why hasn't it been refactored? And there can be multiple reasons. But one reason that I think is very common is that those really problematic hotspots, there are some code quality issues that kind of tend to lead to organizational problems as well. So if you look at the different behavior code analysis, you look at the main contributors and you look at how fragmented the contribution activity is to that file. So you look at purely human perspective. And you will most likely see that that code is not written by one person. It's in a large organization, it might be you know, written by 50 or 60 contributors. And what that most likely means is that, no, you don't have 50 people that know that code. You have no one that actually knows it, right? Uh, because everyone has their small piece of information and the original offers might long be gone. So it might often be that we don't really understand the problem domain well enough in that code. We might not understand the solution well enough. And that kind of, again, raises the hurdle for refactoring it. And in particular, we don't feel any kind of ownership for us as a team, right? So and that makes us much, much less likely to invest the risk into refactoring it. So that's my hypothesis. I mean, what does it mean for an organization if I have that, you know, if I have many people working on the code? You said uh, it's, the problem is not well understood. Um, what are you recommending uh, companies to let's say, to fix that bad code, which is like not, not going away. You know? what, what can you do to, to, to make it happen that, that it doesn't come back? So I like to think that the, the single most important thing you can do is to get situational awareness so that everyone in the organization, engineering, business, everyone knows where the problems are, how severe they are, and what they actually mean to the business. Because once you have that awareness, the next steps tend to be not easy, but doable at least, right? And then it, of course, depends on what kind of issues you have. So if you have things like, uh, so that's, that's another behavior code analysis technique that looks at something called system mastery, for example. And system mastery is not a technical property. It's about how much of the current code is written by the current team. Because I often see this as well, that social and organizational factors like system mastery tends to influence how we perceive the complexity of code. So we kind of tend to underestimate, to overestimate the complexity of unfamiliar code. And that means you can hear complaints about, hey, this piece of code is overly complicated. It's a mess. Whereas in reality, it might simply be that the team never had a chance to get onboarded properly and understand the domain and the solution. So if you know, if you have that situation awareness and knows what your actual problem is, uh, then you can also address it, right? When you when you said um, a lot of people, if, if if a lot of people work on the code, um, that was also a finding uh, that when you analyze all sorts of systems, that um, you have code which is let's say rarely touched, and that uh, you know that's that's not a problem. Then you have code which is often touched by only by uh, a handful of people, like one or two or three uh, people. And then you have the code which is changed often by many people, but also, um, you know, it's not immediately changed. It, it's 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 changed from time to time, you know, and that that puts another burden uh, uh, on it. If we have a mental model on the code. Because we work very often with it, we usually, you know, don't introduce bugs. But if we rarely uh, touch code, we are not 100% familiar with it. And then we introduce new problems. That was also something I found quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I definitely think that um, it's, a, it's a very common problem that I see, that uh, you get lots of contributors in a particular piece of code. And... If that code is also a hotspot, then the situation isn't particularly good because what it basically means is that even if I write a piece of code myself today, then look at it three days later and it looks completely different because you know five other people have been working on the code. So it, it's virtually impossible to maintain a stable mental model. So, and what's so fascinating about this is that very, very often it's about technical properties of the code that kind of lead to organizational issues. So what you will often see is that when you have that kind of code that attracts many different contributors, it's probably because it has good reasons to do so. It's typically a module that's very low on cohesion, meaning it has tons of different responsibilities. So consequently, different teams working on different features, they all end up in the same part of the code because it kind of ties everything together, right? 
So the solution there, it's a, it's a problem that you simply cannot solve with a reorganization because then you will introduce other bottlenecks, right? So the proper solution there would actually be a technical uh, refactoring or redesign, right? Which we kind of improve the organizational fit. And this is one of the things I found uh, fascinating myself. Okay, um, yeah, switching a, a bit uh, the topic, um, going to the to the X-ray. What what is an X-ray? Yeah, so an X-ray is uh, basically a hotspot analysis at the function level. And the reason I started to develop the X-ray analysis was because after writing your code as a crime scene, when I analyzed all these systems, right, I kind of noticed that the hotspots that I tend to find that are most problematic, they're typically really, really large files. We can speak about, you know, it could be thousands of lines of code, uh, occasionally tens of thousands of lines of code. It can be extreme cases like that. And even if you kind of take that large system, you narrow it down to a single hotspot and say, hey, this is your biggest problem. If I go to a client and say that, you know, uh, rewrite this code, it's only 20,000 lines of code. They are not going to be happy, right? It's not actionable. So what an X-ray analysis does is that it takes that complex hotspot, parses it into separate functions, and then it looks at the Git log, where do each commit hit over time? And we kind of sum that up and you get hotspots at a method level. And that's what I've been using successfully as a starting point to, you know, prioritize refactorings in large complex classes and modules. Yeah, yeah. if you tell someone uh, 20,000 lines of code class is a problem, they would say, well, you know, we figured that out <laughs> by ourselves. Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's also, um, it's it's used in many places. So if you, for example, Simon Brown uh, has the C4 uh, architectural model, and there you also have this kind of zooming, or we, you know, Gernot Starke has uh, Arc42. We, we start from a, there we start from a very uh, abstract uh, view and then we dive always deeper it's like a, like google maps when you look at you know look at the map and then you can always go deeper and deeper so you're not lost in details you can navigate uh, quite nicely and i think that's also that's uh, that's uh, quite a, a good idea yeah you use very simple uh, metrics so um, when, when I look at a typical tool like Sona, there are lots of metrics which tell me, you know, this, this is a problem. And um, you, I think you, you only use uh, lines of code of, of a class uh, or a method, right? And intention from, from lines. So no um, uh, uh, dependency analysis and uh, things like that. And this this is based on on some research, and I'm you know could, could you could you please uh, explain why you focus on very few uh, uh, um, metrics and why that's still super powerful? I like to think we evolved that a lot over the past years, but basically the thinking process is that if you look at the research, you will see that a simple metric like the number number of lines of code which it's it's a horrible metric right it's really really bad the thing is that most other metrics are just as bad and lines of code is intuitive it's simple to calculate simple to reason about so that's basically where i started out that uh, we need a complexity dimension for hotspots let's use lines of code and it surprised me how far that actually gets us right it takes us really really far uh, one thing i learned uh, after uh, writing your code as Cramson, it's also that lines of code, it works well, it correlates with most other metrics, but I kind of also learned that um, at some point you want to dig a little bit deeper and uh, provide some actionable advice around what type of refactorings do you need to do and stuff like that. So what I've been working on a lot over the past year is to add uh, different static analysis techniques uh, into a behavior code analysis via codes in, right? And, uh, what we try to do is to look more at the design level, like identifying uh, brain methods, uh, dry violations, you know, the, the stuff that really, really matters for maintainable code. So uh, these days, I might still use the number of lines of code, like an initial visualization, right, to get situation awareness. But when I dig deeper, I typically use this more elaborate set of metrics. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering because my, you know, my understanding was when I do look at a hotspot and I dive deeper, that um, that the hotspots show me. So there are distinct metrics. So when I do look at the hotspots, I look at um, 
lines of code and let's say a cyclomatic complexity represented by um, uh, intention. But a clone detection, uh, you know, violating uh, the tribe principle that I was not aware that this is, uh, is also part of the hotspot. Okay, thank you, uh, Adam. For now, I want to thank you for the discussion uh, on yeah, uh, all, the, all the findings and prioritization work uh, you, you did on, on the code level. And yeah, I want to, want to thank you for, for your time. Thank you very much for having me. A pleasure, as always, and I hope to talk to you again soon. So you look at the research and you see that there's like somewhere between 5 to 20% of all code out there is duplicated to some extent. Exchange coupling in simplest forms is based on uh, finding patterns in the commits. You have uh, the teams separated based on business capabilities, right? And that those business capabilities are reflected in the architecture. Using behavior code analysis, you can show which team works where in the source code. Subscribe to the GoTo YouTube channel now and join the experts in person or online at any upcoming GoTo conference using the promo code BOOKCLUB. Visit gotopia.tech to learn more.